the Mac Observer's Mac Geek app, episode 776 for Monday, August 26th, 2019. Welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the show where we take all your questions, all your tips, all your cool stuff found, we mix them all together, we form like, I don't know, maybe it's soup today, maybe it's, uh, you know, we've got lots of stuff to go through, in fact, we've got lots of stuff, there's a lot of acronyms we're going to talk about, like SMART and, and USB, maybe it's acronym soup, because we've got some cool stuff found. We have some geek challenges. Actually, we have more geek challenges that came in this week than typically come in. So we might have a little bit of a jam session on a few of those to see if we can sort of seed the pot and hopefully get some answers from all of you. Sponsors for this episode include linode.com slash MGG, macsales.com, and ifixit.com slash MGG. We will talk about all of those shortly here. For now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, back in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Fairfield, Connecticut, this is John F. Braun. And how are we today, Mr. John F. Braun? I'm doing fantastic, Dave, because I have plugged. My things that leaked are now not leaking anymore. And when you think about it, it's kind of the, that's kind of the goal life, of life. Yeah. How much I was going to say, how much of your life is spent plugging leaks, whether they be hydraulic or liquid or, or data or data leaks? Yeah. yeah. And plugging those leaks should give you a good feeling. So I so I, I feel very good that I plugged many leaks that I had. This putting week. a putting a bandaid on is plugging a leak of sorts, too, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Sometimes, though, you want your data to like. You want it to leak out, like like we're doing with this show, right? Where you, <laughs> right? No, like 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 this is intentional leak. And sometimes you want to set up like a server that will, you know, send your data to people, leak your data to people, as you might say. And that's where our first sponsor, Linode, comes in because they have these all SSD based servers that sit in the cloud, and that way they're there on their forty gigabit network. I mentioned they're all SSD. You can pick from any one of Linode's 10 worldwide data centers. And they're cool because you pay for what you use with hourly billing across all plans and all their add-on services. If you want to leave a server up and running all month, you start with a server that's just, they're nanode, which is just five bucks a month. And it's cool. You can get a command line or you can actually have their automated engine set up your server for you with lots of things. Like if you want WordPress, boom, you want to set up a VPN, boom, you're good, right? Like, do you want to set up a Minecraft server? Boom. You just choose that and it auto selects it all as part of their new cloud manager. You've got to check it out and we've got a deal. Go to linode.com slash MGG. That's L I N O D E.com slash MGG coupon code MGG two zero one nine gets you $20 in credit. Yes, right away, $20, not $20 after you do something else. $20 right away to start MGG2019. Go, do it, enjoy, spin up your server now. Thanks to Linode for sponsoring this episode. We have, um, we have a lot of things to go through today, John. Should we start with our, uh, should we start with our, uh, our cool stuff found? Z cool stuff's found. I think we say it that way. Right? Uh, we should start at the beginning. Well, isn't that what happens by definition, though? I mean, don't we get to decide what the beginning well, is? Well, it depends on your temporal reference. Right. Um, that is fair, because, <laughs> because time is only a linear construct to our feeble human brains. Like, that's just a thing that, that we created, I, uh, I think. No. Uh, yes. You know, Plex, I'm, I'm a big fan of using Plex, John. And they just came out with their Plex desktop app for Mac, right? So now you don't have to use Plex in a browser if you want to use, like, if you want to view videos from your Mac 
and which is something I do all the time when I'm traveling. In fact, I was down, I was down sort of near you this week. I went, uh, the, I went with the girls and we saw the Jonas brothers down in Connecticut at Mohegan. And, uh, and we got back to the room after the show and we wanted to watch a, a movie or whatever. And I was like, Oh wait, I can hook up Plex to the TV, which I do with my Mac. I, you know, HDMI cable with a USB C dongle and good to go. And this time I was able to do it with the Plex app. So I didn't have to fight with which browser I was going to use and all that. I just launched the app. It's perfect. So, um, that's, I don't know. That's, it's cool. You use Plex yet. Have you set up no. Plex? Dude, dude, you even, you have that Synology, that DS 918 plus you have a new Apple TV, right? That can run the Plex app. Uh, did you get, I you got I that? Do. You got that new Apple yeah, yeah. TV, right? Yeah. Yeah, the 4K uh, HD uh, deal. Oh, yeah. So you got to put, you got to, yeah, 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 yeah. You're, yes, dude. It I don't, you know, I got to say, I only really use it as a target for streaming from my computers. I really don't use the built-in apps. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty much, most of the apps I run are on the TiVo, and, and I'm okay with that. Oh, uh-huh. so, so why don't you run Plex on your TiVo? We do that all the time at home. Uh, See? I like, probably should. I and know. Actually, now that I got new toys, I think I can probably run Plex on my new TV, and I can run Plex on my new um, uh, 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 Blu-ray player. Oh, that's probably true. So I will tell you, though, the Plex people have said that they, or maybe it was the TiVo people, but whatever, whoever said it, there is a deeper, much deeper integration happening between those two platforms right now. Currently... It's, it's just an, like, it's an app in TiVo, right? Just like Amazon prime or whatever you just go and and it's there. But unlike Amazon prime, everything that's in Plex is just in Plex, right? And, and you have to launch the Plex app on the TiVo and then you can see it, but they are starting, they are saying that they're working on a deeper integration so that you can have your Plex content sort of exposed to you know, potentially things in like your, my shows list so that it can pull from that, just like it can pull from a Netflix or a, you know, a Hulu or whatever there, which is pretty darn cool. So I, I'm a big fan of Plex. So big fan. All right. I'll, uh, I'll, uh, uh I, I want to keep it simple. You know, I'm, I'm happy. Plex is soup. With- That's the Wait, wait, wait. I don't, I, I, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Plex is the simplest way to manage your media library by far. By okay. far. Yeah. No, it's like it's built for it. Here's what Plex is built for. If you have a big, you know, like your movies and or, or music or photos or TV shows and or right, you can do them all. Plex is built to make it super simple and streamlined and easy to have all your stuff in one place and just play your content when when and where you want to play it. So you want to download to your iPad for an offline viewing, no problem. You want to stream to your TV, no problem. You want to stream to your laptop while you're in a hotel room, no problem, right? Like, no, 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 Plex, Plex is that. It, if you want to keep it simple, you use Plex. That's right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Right now for, for that purpose, I use Video Station from uh, our friends at uh, Synology, but um, from what I hear you saying, I should consider Plex to give me more flexibility. It is. It's, so Video Station is like, it, it, it's a, it's, I would call it watered down Plex. It, it's similar, right? Like, so you've got the concept, right? Like that's what Plex does, but Plex does it so much better. Like there's no Video Station app for your Mac. And even if you wanted to use Video Station from your Mac, you'd have to worry about like port forwarding and all of that other stuff. No, you just launch Plex. It takes care of it. It knows what to do. Mm. Makes life easy. Yeah, that's good. All right. It is a well, good thing. Uh, well, it's good that they, they now have an app. Well, you now have their app. They've had an app for a very long time. Oh, 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 I said, right. I'm rewinding. They now have an app for the Mac. Yes, that is true. <laughs> I forgot where we app for. Do they have an app for Windows? Yes, they do. Yeah, yeah, they're desktop. Did though. they? And now, uh, so the 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 Mac app is a relatively new thing. As is the Windows app. Yeah, the, the both both of them. Oh, are okay, out now. okay. Yep. yep. Yeah, it's Groovy. pretty good. Yeah, no, they're they're good people. Yep, and and uh, and a good company. So, all right. Uh, next on the cool stuff found list is uh, lawyer Jeff said. I found a ScanSnap competitor with an Android tablet touchscreen, appears to be based in Houston, called Raven, raven.com. 
So uh, if you go to raven.com, you can learn all about their, they've got their scanners, which has the touchscreen right on it, which might make life a lot easier than having to manage it from somewhere else. And, uh, and it obviously it would work with the Mac and all that. It's just that the touchscreen on the thing is like an Android. Um, it's Android based, but you know, it doesn't really matter. It, it, you don't need Android anything else to use it. So we'll, uh, we'll put that in the show notes too, because that's what we do. Have you ever checked these out? I'd never heard about them before. Um, no, I'm still, a, a, I have a, a, a scan snap and although it's a, somewhat proprietary and that you have to run their app and they, uh, as far as I know, don't offer a standards based interface like Twain. Yep. But, um, okay. No, it's good to know there's a, another option out there. Yeah, for sure. All right. Uh, let's see, Greg. Oh yeah. You know, we've been talking about opening files on, um, on, on, uh, or opening URLs rather on Mac OS and Greg sent in this cool stuff found called opener for iOS. And he says, it's really handy to use with the share extension. Whenever I come across a link and I want to force it to open in Safari, because otherwise the link insists upon opening an app or I want to force it to open in an app because sometimes it might open in Safari. I use this. And with the share extension, you can kind of force it to do whichever you want. He says, one of the reasons why I do it is in order to filter the reviews for a product on Amazon by typing in keywords you need. And you need to be on the web page to do that. You can't do it in the app. So I use opener to force open Safari. Then I tap the share extension and select opener and select Safari, and that forces it to open as a web page instead of the app. So I'll put that in the uh, I'll put that link in the show notes too. That's pretty cool. Thanks, Greg. Pretty good, huh? Lots of control over your URLs in the last couple of weeks here on Mac Geek. Yeah, yeah it gets uh, it gets kind of squirrely. <laughs> to be honest, the whole absolutely what what's happening underneath the covers there. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, you want to take this Eric one? I had, I, had, I had prepped this one for you, but because you love RC default app, but, uh, but no, this is awesome. Okay, and, go. And actually, I had um, it, it's on one of my machines here, but um, you know, we'll let Eric lead us in here. And Eric says you probably got tons of feedback regarding RC default app mentioned in MGG seven seven five, but I thought I'd chime in with Swift default apps. Swift default apps is, as the name implies, written in Swift and is meant to be a replacement to RC default app. And he gives us a link where you can find it on GitHub, and we'll put that in our lovingly handcrafted kind of show notes. <laughs> well, they're definitely handcrafted. Yeah. We, we do yeah, it all together. But I, I, yeah. But I actually stumbled across this a, a while ago. Um, the thing is, I, I, I don't think I moved to... Uh, Again, I have it on one of my machines here, and I think I tried it out, and I'm like, well, it looks the same, and it offers the same functionality, but it sounds like, yeah, it's, it's embracing, you know, Apple's new uh, language there. So, well, it's, uh, and it's in it's, active development, it, like, right? Didn't we decide last week that we found that RC default app was last, like, last updated 12 years ago? Uh, correct, um, though it still works, because the fundamentals of what it's showing you haven't really changed, but... Um, but yeah, if if uh, if you're a fan of uh, or you need RC default app, then maybe using the the newer the new kit on the block here is may, may make sense. Yeah, my guess is forward. RC default app will not work with Catalina. Like I just can't imagine that it was built as really? a 64 bit app hmm. 12 years ago. No, I don't think that yeah, would have been they possible. Say, but they say they're a 64 bit app. RC default know. app does really. All right. I thought when I went to their page, they said they're. Oh, yeah, you're right. They... It says it's a universal thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Go figure. All right. Cool. But maybe, you know, if, if it's written in Swift, um, maybe it's more efficient and takes less memory or, or whatever. So yeah, uh, the, the nice yeah. part about either one of these is they aren't actually they aren't running actively on your Mac. I mean, they're there in, as a pref pane. Right. But they're not once you just are using them to make a change to your settings files like they're not doing anything you couldn't just do with the terminal. And so if they stop functioning, whatever changes they've made or that you've made with them will stick, right? You could uninstall, you could make all your changes and uninstall one of these things and it's all the changes are going to stick. It's not doing anything actively, which is probably, I mean, it's, so it's a very simple thing, which is probably why it still works. So. 
Yeah, cool. Thanks, Eric. Good stuff. Last week, we also mentioned that uh, I was using this app called Fluid to compartmentalize web apps. And one of the ones that I use to compartmentalize with it is Facebook so that I can have a separate app for Facebook. And more importantly, I can quit that. Uh, I don't have to worry about Facebook, you know, chewing up RAM and, you know, some buried browser tab somewhere or something. Well, Ben says, if you weren't using Fluid for Facebook, you might like an, this menu bar thing called Go for Facebook. It runs in the menu bar and I can press a keyboard shortcut to show or hide its window which even appears atop full screen apps. So you can have Facebook running all the time in your max menu bar, if you so choose. And it is available. This go for Facebook app says it's available for free for a limited time. Now we don't know how long the limits are. Um, it might be limited for, you know, a few decades or it might be limited for a few days. We don't know, but, uh, but there you go. So thanks for, thanks for the heads up on that, Ben stuff amplify one of the um one of the more interesting mesh consumer grade mesh solutions that's out there they are amplify is ubiquity's consumer brand for mesh products and they they do a nice job with things well they just uh updated their software this week john and now amplify users get a free inbound VPN so that if you're, you know, out and about and you want a VPN into your home network, either to access resources on your network or to tunnel your traffic so that, you know, wherever you are doesn't get to see it, Amplify now lets you do that for free, which is the same. It, I think they, I'm trying to think, uh, I think Orbi might have that inbound open VPN Synology definitely has the, uh, they, they've got actually the most robust VPN inbound server that I've ever seen on a router. Uh, but, uh, but it's nice to see people adding this. You can get um, VPN with Eero as part of their Eero plus, but that's not inbound to your network. It's using, oh, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's using the people that used to be cloak. And I can't remember the, the current name off the top of my head, John, but uh but it's nice to see Amplify add that. It's good stuff. Any thoughts on any of that, John? <clears throat> VPNs are good. Uh, VPNs are good. I will agree with that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I realized last week that I recorded the entire episode while connected to ExpressVPN. So I was connected to ExpressVPN. You and I were connected over Discord. And then I was also streaming out to uh, to the world. But, um, you know, it worked, so I, I guess that's good. Uh, you know, normally I, if, if I'm doing a VoIP connection like for a podcast, I would not run through the extra layer of a VPN. But the nice part is I didn't even notice. So I guess that's a good thing. You did, Nobody noticed. The show seemed to work fine. So from my hotel room in, uh, in Orlando. All right. What? Uh, oh, so... We are, we're using yet a, another different audio setup today. I Those of you that were at MacStock or anybody that sort of paid attention to what was going on uh, from afar knows that we tried to use the new Rodecaster Pro as our mixer for and recording interface for our remote at MacStock. But the one that we had had some bad, uh, had two bad mic inputs on it. Well, I have a new one that doesn't have two bad mic inputs. In, fa in fact, it has all good mic inputs. And that's what we're using to mix and record the show today. So uh, if if you notice anything odd about the sound, let us know. Uh, good, bad, just different, that's fine. If you're indifferent, let us know that too. It's fine. Uh, feedback at MacGeekGab.com would be where you could let us know that. Did you say feedback at MacGeekGab.com? I did. I said feedback at MacGeekGab.com. And I, I will say that having this all in one, as opposed to this, you know, the Frankenstein that I built over the last, whatever, 14 <laughs> years. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, what the roadcaster does is it has everything. You just plug your mic into it and it's got all of the noise gates and compressors and uh, it's a mixer. It even has an SD card port where you can have it record, but it can also output to your Mac. It also, um, what's cool is like for you, John, 
I want to have your audio coming into this mixer so that I can have you in one of the faders on the mixer. So if you're not loud enough or whatever, I can just control you. Well, this mixer has its own USB input so that when I connect the mixer to the Mac, it registers a USB input. I point you to that and now you're there. But what's even cooler is it does what the podcasting industry calls a mix minus. So it sends you a mix of everything minus you so that you're not getting yourself echoed back. And it just kind of happens automatically um, right there in it. So, which is, it's, it's pretty cool. It's all in one. The, the, the weirdest part that I'm noticing, and I've, I, this is actually the second podcast episode that I recorded with it. I recorded um, the gig gab podcast that I do for musicians earlier today using it. But um, it, I'm, I hear, a hiss in my ears. You don't hear that on the recording. It's not a noisy recording, but even when all the faders are down and nothing is running through it, I, there's just a, like a, a hiss that I hear in my ears. And so I got to figure out what that, um, what that is. It, it, I sort of, it goes away. I mean, it, it becomes far less noticeable once you start recording and, and all of that, but, um, but it is interesting. So, but it is fun. It has like, uh, you can put, I didn't, play our theme music through the board i just played it from the computer but i could like program the theme music into the boards and it's got pads on it where you can just trigger sounds in fact i think if i get it wrong i hope i don't get it wrong but i think i have the ability to like trigger applause oh that's laughter see they laughed at me because um <laughs> yeah there you go so but that's just one of those things you can replace it don't worry we're not going to be adding in those kinds of effects on a regular basis just <laughs> demoing here yeah we don't need a laugh track we don't need a laugh track, yeah. All right. Well, sometimes you need the sad trombone, though. So anyway, that's the uh, that's the Roadcaster Pro. Uh, yeah. Good. Anything else, John? Good. 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 Okay. Uh, I want to talk about our next sponsor, which is Otherworld Computing at uh, MaxSales.com. You know, oftentimes we'll get like talking points from them about products that they want us to talk about, or sometimes they'll say, just come up with whatever you want. And today I actually get to read an email from listener Edward uh, that he wrote. And he says, I want to brag about one of your sponsors, Otherworld Computing. He says, I realize I'm not telling you anything you didn't already know. I retired from gainful employment a few years back from a hundred percent PC company. As soon as possible, I purchased my first Mac, a refurbished MacBook Air. Later, I handed it down to a family member and bought a new MacBook. It has been really great, but I've always wanted an iMac. It was hard to justify the cost since I do nothing productive anymore. I just tinker. Then I decided to look at OWC, and there I purchased a 21 and a half inch late 2013 2.7 gigahertz quad core i5 iMac. Thunderbolt, 16 gigs of DRAM, 500 gig SSD, all of that good stuff used, of course, 90 day OWC limited warranty. Uh, he was able to get it, I think for like less than 700 bucks. He says, this machine looks and works like brand new. It was delivered to my door in three days. Awesome service. The 500 gig SSD and 16 gigs of Ram make my nothing really important work really fast. He says, I can now hurry up and do nothing. If you waste time, you should do it really fast too. He says, I just wanted to share the fact that the non-super users also have great options at OWC. They are truly a sponsor that I support and highly recommend. And you hear us say this all the time here on this show, either on episodes that they sponsor or don't. OWC is a company that we trust. It is the first place John and I look whenever we're buying anything to enhance our Macs, but you can also buy it. You can also use OWC for a used Mac. So thank you, Edward, for your email. And thank you to OWC at MacSales.com for sponsoring this episode. All right, Mr. Braun, shall we go on to some of these geek challenges that I mentioned earlier today? We're not going to have answers. In. I mean, we yeah, might have I answers. Can. Yeah, we might. We That's, may have answers. We might. Yeah. You never know. All right. So we'll start with Matt here. Um, I, I love this idea. I, I think, I think I'm think i sharing this only because I love this idea. He says, uh, I know clipboard managers have come up several times recently, 
but I have yet to find one that scratches my particular itch. And I'm hoping somebody can help. He says, when I was a Windows user, I had a clipboard manager that was very intuitive for him. Control C copied. Control C again copied another entry into the stack. We'll come back to that term. Control V pasted the last thing that was copied into the stack. And he says stack. And he says it turned the clipboard into what he called the last in, first out stack, meaning whatever you copied most recently would be pasted most recently and then removed. So that if you copied three things, let's say you copy item number one, item number two, item number three, then you go over to where you want to paste them. You paste, it pastes number three. You paste again, it pastes number two. You paste again, it pastes number one. And he says, uh, but it goes deeper than that. He says, say you've copied 10 things into the clipboard and you want to paste the third item from the last. He says, with this thing that I was using on Windows, I would hold down the control key on the, on the Mac. We would use command uh, if we can find something like this. And I would hit V three times while holding down control. And I could see it scroll through the things in the clipboard and I get to pick the one that I want. He says, I'm looking for something like this on the Mac. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it exists. Honestly, you know what, Matt? I don't know if it exists either, but I like this idea of a clipboard as a stack. But quite frankly, it would be a massive change to my personal workflow to use something like this because I'm used to using my clipboard as a catch-all and then happily digging through and finding the thing that I want. Um, I use it really as a peace of mind so that I know I can just copy a bunch of things and they will all always be there for me when I need them. But, uh, but I can see the use case where using it as a stack like this would be super handy. So if anyone knows, let us know, John, you, I, I'm assuming you don't know anything. <clears throat> Not about this particular topic. Well, that, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. I should have been a little more, <laughs> should have been a little more specific <laughs> with my statement. Yeah, yeah. But I do like the, uh, introduction of the, uh, terminology here which uh, we uh, computer science people like is that there's lifo and fifo well yeah yeah right he he talked about a lifo stack because that's last in and first out and the way stacks work is you use push to put something on the stack and pop right to take it off so um to use it and take it off so right isn't that right am i am i remembering my my cs terminology correctly yeah but um, but the nature of the stack can be, yeah, either the first thing you put in is the first thing you take out, or the first thing you put in is the last thing you take that's out, right? right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. FIFO for first in, first out. LIFO for last in. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Cool. Yeah, I like this idea. Uh, it'd be interesting to see if uh, if we can if we can find one. So let us know. You know, we already told you how to email us. If you're a premium listener, email us at premium at maccab that we would we would love to uh, we'd love to hear from you there too. All right, John, shall we move on to Mike's Geek Challenge? It's a good one. Yeah, he Thanks. says at the college at where I work, I have a couple of new iMacs that we teach from. One of our professors would rather use Windows, so I have the hard drive partitioned and Windows installed with Boot Camp. No problem. The thing I would like to do is have an OS selector without having to hold down the alt or option key it says i guess that's too hard for this particular professor do you know of any way to do this he says i used to use ref it back in the day but i've been reading a lot about it not working anymore maybe i can find a version of grub for darwin grub being the boot a very popular bootloader uh used on linux so uh any other ideas oh, man like I, I feel like there's got to be a way in, I, I feel like there's an NVRAM command to set this, John, to always show the bootloader, but, um, you know, and, and oh um, yeah, right. Oh, default, right. And uh, yeah, yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah. That. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Like, like there's boot args, right. Where you can, you can set all those things. Is there a list? I don't, yeah, I don't know the answer to this, but I feel like this should be like, cause you can set a, a boot argument to always be in verbose mode or always boot in safe mode or single user mode. But I'm wondering, there's, I feel like there's gotta be one that's going to always show that, that, you know, what he's calling the, the boot selector or the OS selector, which is what you get when you start up and hold down option immediately. Ooh. 
args. All right. Right. So it yeah, you would use the nvram command and then boot dash args and set something. But I'm I've looked at a couple of list of you know what I would call incomplete list of boot arguments, and I haven't found one yet that shows uh, that you know lets you force that that uh, that bootloader. So I don't know, yeah. man. Yeah, I found a list too. I mean, you can go to the terminal and do man and vram, and it'll give you some information. Okay. But I believe there's a command where you can list all of the variables. I, I, I found an article here, and uh, hey, okay, we'll link to it. Why yeah, not? That shows sure. many of them, and actually one of them is named boot-args. Well, that's what we're talking about, is, yeah, is setting, but it's yeah. it's not really showing all of the, yeah, it's kind of mysterious here. Yeah. So. And complete list of boot args. I will, I will put that in the uh, show notes, but I don't think there's anything in there. That's the, that's the one I found is on one on superuser.com. But I feel like, man, like mm -hmm. there's gotta be something close. I, 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 or I wonder if there's another way to hack around it. Like, could you, let's think about this, right? Could you, set up an OS that boots by default that, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it's not terrible to having, having to hold down the key, but, um, but I get the idea here. Well, I think the problem is, you know, if you turn on the computer and forget to hold down the key, then it, you know, boots one way or yeah. the other. And yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, Alex in the chat room at macgeekgab.com slash stream says there was something called boot params, but it's no longer supported. So I don't know. Let's see. Yeah, there's, there is a boot. Param. Yeah. I don't know. Hopefully somebody will know. Cause I like this stuff. That's, um, you know, that's why we do this show. Keeps us, keeps us honest. Keeps us <laughs> thinking. Um, all right. One from Mark here as we plow through these. Mark asks, he says, I recently got a 3D printer. It's very cool for making some useful items, but it makes a lot of noise for hours or even days while it's doing its printing. My wife made me put it in a far, far away place in our house, away from my iMac. To get files to it, I've been using a micro SD card and sneaker netting it. The printer does have a USB port on it, but having a USB cable across that distance is not feasible. Is there any such thing as wireless USB and how does it work? I have seen things like this in the past. I mean, th so there's a couple ways to go about this. If there is some generic, you know, plug this wireless dongle into each device and neither one of them knows that it's wireless but it's actually sending your USB data across a wireless link instead of wired. Like that would be cool. And I, I feel like I've seen those kinds of things, but when I started searching for them today, I couldn't find one at all. Right. So, uh, the, the next thing is, is this something that could benefit from one of those, you know, network, let's take your printer and make it into a network printer devices. You know, Lantronics used to make one. There's one built into a lot of routers, right? Cause you can plug your printer into your router and then it just magically gets shared on your network, even though it's not a network printer to start cause you know, the router's doing it. Or like I said, the Lantronics device, like in his specific case, it doesn't just need to be wireless USB. It just needs to be can I make my printer work on the network somehow? Uh, so like th to me, those are the two paths. I feel like path number two might work, but I don't know if his 3d printer, like the way I, like, is it a normal, it, it might not be like a normal printer where you're just putting things in the queue and it like, it might have some, there might be a whole lot more to it. It might not act like a printer, I guess is what I'm saying. It might be, I am controlling a USB device, not I'm printing to that device over there. So I don't know. What do you think, Mr. Braun? What I think is that a few years ago, I did have a uh, hard drive. I can't remember the vendor right now, but they were using something called UWB, otherwise known as ultra wideband technology. Okay to accomplish a wireless USB connection. Really? 
Yeah, and I still have the dongle. I don't have the drive anymore because uh, the the thing is, it didn't really work. It was very sensitive to the orientation of the dongle and where the drive was. Is that it? Either worked great or it didn't. And I actually found a and and you probably found it already. But if you didn't, I'll link to this article. But it's a thing on LifeWire, uh, actually dated May nineteenth, twenty nineteen, saying, "Hey, you know." Ultra wideband. One of the things that it can accomplish is wireless USB. Yeah, I don't know how many. Uh, I don't know if anybody's actively making. Yeah, I'm not seeing that anything. Uses this. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, you probably found the article. Yeah, know. yeah, for sure. Huh. Okay, so you found the the article, or if not, I'll I'll, I'll link to it here. But um, but that was one proposed solution was using this certain frequency spectrum to accomplish wireless usb huh that makes sense yeah i mean i can I, like my guess is that they're that this is totally doable and not entirely necessary it, like the use cases for it are not widespread enough that it would be worth someone manufacturing a, a you know a generic wireless usb device May, maybe it would though i mean i don't know it depends on how reliable it is, how how universal it actually is, right? Like if you if you build this thing, is it just the same as buying a USB cable? Is it just as good for you know for all the use cases or most of the use cases that would need to happen? Yeah, I mean, this article says that uh, you know because the, the the rollout of this wasn't entirely successful. Okay, um, they're saying Wi-Fi is probably a better choice, so you right. can get a. USB Wi-Fi dongle. I think that that may be. Uh... So here's my problem with with this. Every mm. search that you do or that I've done for a USB Wi-Fi dongle finds the reverse. It's like, oh, you have a laptop and you need Wi-Fi for it. So plug this thing in and you'll get Wi-Fi because it's a USB Wi-Fi dongle. Right. I actually want a wireless USB dongle. But good luck telling Google that you don't want the thing that it thinks you want when you put in wireless USB. Like I I'm pretty good searching Google. I could not get Google to filter out all of the, you know, USB Wi-Fi dongles, which is not what, what we want, right? You know, we want the other way around. We want USB wireless, not USB to Wi-Fi. So yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, I don't know, man. I think for now, I think, you know, you're going to have to run a cable like a caveman. <laughs> to yeah. Accomplish yeah. This. And I know that's not the answer we want. Well, but. yeah. Or, you know, get, is it possible to have like a raspberry Pi manage this process and put the plug, the, you know, the Pi USB into the, um, into the, the 3d printer and then use that as like the, the server device and then, you know, send your, instead of sneaker netting your files over with your, you know, with your SD card or whatever, just send it to the Raspberry Pi and have the Raspberry Pi do the, you know, do the thing. Like maybe that's the answer. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Maybe somebody should do a Kickstarter or something like that on this. Yeah. Again, I there. like, yeah, maybe, mm -hmm. right. That would answer the question. Is there enough need? That's you're right. That's the beauty of Kickstarter. Yeah. All right. Anyway. Anyway. Uh, one last one. Uh, here. Uh, Allison writes, in iStat menus, if we watch the CPU section on top of seeing the load on the CPU and CPU temperature, we can also watch the CPU clock speed. And you need the Intel Power Gadget installed in order for iStat menus to show you that. It's a very cool thing to, to do. Uh, she continues, my understanding of how the processors worked in our Macs was that they have the ability to clock up under higher system load. For example, according to Mac Tracker, my 2016 MacBook Pro has a processor speed of 2.7 gigahertz, but a max processor speed of 3.6. I'm asking the question because under high system load, streaming video to the internet while she records her podcast, my MacBook Pro is actually clocking down to less than 2 gigahertz. It seems I don't understand how this works or something is wrong with my Mac. 
And she offers even more details uh, in showing some screenshots and all this in our forums at MacGeekUp.com slash forums. And I've got a link to the specific forum post in the show notes for you all. But so the question is, like, why is it clocking down or up? And I think you did some research on this, Mr. Braun. Well, I mean, Intel does have an article uh, talking about Turbo Boost and when it when it should be enabled and when it shouldn't be. Now, one, there's a, and I'm going to assume that she checked this out here, but the thing is it's only supported under a certain class of processors. Right. Well, let's assume that what she said, let's take what her statement at face value, right? That, that her, her Mac has is, you know, 2.6 turbo boostable or 2.7 turbo, turbo boostable up to 3.6. So, so check that box. Now, why isn't it doing it? Yeah. Well, it could be based on this article talking about turbo boost. It could be that it's not enabled on this machine. I mean, I can't imagine that Apple would screw that up, but maybe they did. I don't know. Or there's some Uh, weird. Yeah, I don't think let's assume no. Right. I mean, it could be, you're right. But, but I mean, Apple is, is, Adver- like when when sold, this machine was advertised as it supports Turbo Boost up to three point six. So again, let's check that mm-hmm. box. Like, like why? El- what? What? How does Turbo Boost get enabled? What is the like? Th- so wh- it's what- magic. The 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 it, it it and from what I, from what Intel says, it's totally up to the processor to decide when to do this within the system design parameters. Okay, so the the CPU decides on its own. Like the, oh, the there's no way that the OS, like in software, can tell it yes, go, don't go, or can it send it? Well, hints? I mean, here's what they say. So they say okay. the processor must be working in the power temperature and specification limits of the thermal design power of the system. Now, could be that for whatever reason, if the power temperature and other things are not within the specs of turbo boost, it's not going to enable it. That makes sense. Like on a, on a laptop, if the battery gets below on a Mac laptop on a bat, if the, when the battery gets below or at 5% and lower, the CPU is automatically slowed down to 800 megahertz. Um, right. Right. So, so, uh, you know, stands to reason that, that, that would be one part of it, but I mean, I think she's plugged in while she's doing this, but it could be there's something wrong with her Mac. Um, uh, right. Which, like they say here, one of the criteria is that, I mean, the system could be running hot and if it's running hot, it's not going to enable turbo boost. Cause it's like, well, you know, I, I don't want to overclock and shut your system down. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, maybe get a utility to run your fans a little faster and maybe run your processor a little cooler and maybe it'll kick in. I'm, oh, that's I'm a good just, idea. Yeah. Because oh, that's yeah. one of the criteria that they use to enable this. So right. maybe that's happening. I mean, you know, it's it's protecting itself. You know, sure. it's not going to it's not going to overclock or, uh, you know, turbo boost if, if again, it's going to result in because pretty much any processor these days, if, if it runs too hot, it shuts down because it doesn't want to destroy your computer, right. or your, your, your yeah, life. <laughs> this is a good thing. Yeah, right. Yeah. Now, they also have a tool. Now, unfortunately, it's not on the Mac, but they do have, I think it's called the Intel Turbo Boost Monitor. Though it only runs under Windows. So I'd be curious. I, I wonder if you run that in a VM, if you could see... Oh, some details here, right? Yeah, right. Again, it makes me sad that they don't have the tool for, but it seems to be only a windows tool. So, um, interesting. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Right. Right. For sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. But I'm still thinking here. I'm, I'm wondering if, uh, you know, uh, again, one of the, one of the bullet points in their article, they said it's only going to run, if you're working within the power temperature and specification limit of the system. And I mean, the guys at Apple are smart, the guys and gals, you know, everybody yeah. there, 
<laughs> yeah, right. right. No matter your you, you're using the, the yeah okay. the New England gender non-specific <laughs> uh, and yet yet lately insensitive use of the word guys, which is just people. Right. I, I get it. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and that's my my interpretation. I mean, I've even seen females, you know, come up to a group and say, "Hey, guys." And sure. Like, okay, that's cool. You know, yeah. Whatever. Yeah. But uh, you know. That, no, that's no, not you're, for everybody. Yeah, you're right. That's interesting, huh? So I wonder if, uh, and I may try this. The thing is, I looked at both of my systems here, uh, both my 2012 MacBook Pro and my um, 2014 Mac Mini, and looking at the 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 iStat menus, they both regularly run both above and below the stated frequency of. Um, yeah. Oh, for of, sure. Of, of, of the processor that you see in the get info. Yeah, so, I wonder um, how long a system could run, you know, above its stated, um, you know, in turbo boost mode. Like th there's got to be a limited time that it, you know, will stay up there and before it backs off. And I'm guessing that's related to heat and power um, mm -hmm. at some level. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. So check it out. Uh, visit our forums at macgeekup.com slash forums. And we'll, like I said, we'll put a link to the specific post right there so you can jump right to Allison's post if you've got some thoughts or, or want to see about this. You know, I, I had suggested maybe she reboot or uh, re reset SMC because when it's hardware, but it's not hardware, sometimes it's SMC. She said she had already tried that because she's been listening to Mac Geek Up for a long time. And she also like really knows her stuff. So uh, no great surprise that she had already tried that. But that's, you know, when you're in a scenario like this, that is a very smart thing to, to do. So speaking of smart, John. Uh, uh, oh, okay. oh, go ahead. I, I no. would say, honestly, I find the whole concept of this technology annoying. Is like, dude, just run at the clock speed that you advertise. Why do you have like this clock speed and then like like a you know bonus clock speed? What? Why not just run? Do you really want the answer to that? Are, I mean, you know the answer, right? It, it's to save power, right? Right. I mean, like that's the that's why. I mean, that's why you'll see your Mac throttle way down when it when it doesn't need the the speed so that it's not using all that power. Yeah. Yeah, because it doesn't need to run. Yeah, but it's like, dude, like a car. It's like, you know, you got this many horsepower. That's it. That That's your maximum, right? Well, but that's what's happening here, right? It like, doesn't like, you, you don't like overclock your engine to get like more horsepower, right? I don't know. Well, some people do. <laughs> some people use nitrous, right? Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> right. Good, <laughs> like, good point. So, good point. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they, when there's so a this will, is like nitrous for your processor, okay. But it's like uh, built-in uh, factory nitrous, like you know, <laughs> it's it's OEM nitrous. <laughs> I like it. That's good. All right. Uh, speaking of smart, we do have some information from last week on smart, and uh, but first, I want to talk about our next sponsor, which is iFixit. Man, I, you know. I need to take apart the iMac over in the house because that hard drive in it died and I just need to take it out. And I, it, like opening up an iMac with that glass screen and all the little parts that are inside because it's so thin, right? It's flat. It's packed in. I would never feel comfortable doing that if I didn't have the guides that iFixit provides because they are on a mission to make it easier for you to fix your electronics, especially your Mac, right? Because they're Mac people like we are. And they've got over 50,000 free repair guides. And if you need them, a huge selection of parts and tools so that they can be your one-stop shop for do-it-yourself repairs. And at iFixit, you'll find everything you need to fix or upgrade your Mac yourself. And you might not know this, but if you listen here, you might already know this, but you can replace the battery in your MacBook Pro, even the Retina models, and the MacBook Air, and iFixit makes it easy with their all-in-one fix kits. In the kit, you get the part backed by their warranty and high-quality tools that are backed for life. To top it off, you get the aforementioned really helpful repair guides for free with step-by-step -step instructions and amazing photos that really make it easy for you, even the first time that you're in. Like when I take apart a computer for the first time, I feel like I know what I'm going to see because you know why? I've seen it. I've seen the pictures right there on iFixit and I know what I can do. You've got to check it out to see how easy it is to do this stuff for yourself. And you can visit iFixit.com slash MGG to fix your Mac today 
and get $10 off your next $50 fix. That's right. iFixit.com slash MGG to fix your Mac today and you get $10 off your next $50 fix. So go check this out. Again, iFixit.com slash MGG. And our sincere thanks to iFixit for doing all that they do and posting all those great repair guides and, of course, for sponsoring this episode. It's smart time, Mr. Braun. And uh, Chris, no. So in the last episode, we... We're not so smart time. Well, believe it or not, though. (laughs) We're going to get smarter time. Correct. Yeah. So in the last episode, we were talking about how disk utility on NVMe Max at least my 2019 iMac does not show the smart status. It says that smart is not supported on the internal NVMe drive. Well, Chris writes, he said, um, you discussed reading smart data and it's true that Apple's disk utility doesn't support querying smart data from the drive, but that's probably because it's using outdated smart code. However, if you download a recent, recent version of the smart mon tools package, uh, that's the code upon which all of these actual utilities run, then you'll find that that does support NVMe SSDs. Uh, You have to use the command line and you can get smart. We'll put a link to where you can download a a bare package of smart mon tools, but you can also install it with homebrew by just typing brew space, install space, smart mon tools as, as one word is that third thing. And, uh, and it'll install it and then you can just run smart, uh, I think you run smart control and, and, uh, and it'll, your smart control dash a and your disc name and it'll show you. And I ran it on my iMac and it worked great. I also tried something else on my iMac, John, you suggested running drive DX in the last episode. And mm-hmm. I tried that too. Works totally fine. I can see all the smart data on my drive. In fact, because I've installed the drive DX tools, I can see the smart data on my external drive with drive DX as well. So that was a good suggestion, my friend. So thank you for, uh, well, thank you for that. And thanks to Chris for uh, SmartMon tools. That's, I, I love these things. It's fun. Right. And I'm going to toss this into the ring here, but Dave, I, I've been running this tool for quite a while and it's called Smart Reporter. Okay. And based on what I know, it uses the SmartMon tools uh, or, or it has it embedded within it. And does it have an? Uh, do you know if it has a version new enough to um, to to see it on the? And I mean, I can test it, but I I don't want to test it right now because you know I'm doing this other thing. No. So okay, <laughs> all right, cool. Well, I'll test that. Yeah, we'll, we'll see where we get. That's good. But um, but no, I I like Smart Mon tool or, or Smart Reporter. What it does is that it will also do daily checks. So I get an email every day from smart reporter saying hey i ran these you know i ran the checks and yeah. uh, everything looks good which uh, makes me happy that's yeah that's <laughs> that's a good thing for sure yeah cool all right cool thank you chris good stuff all right where are we here How, where are we on time oh we're doing great on time this is man we are like pros i think this new mixer makes us <laughs> podcast more efficiently uh, all right you think uh, no i don't think so at all <laughs> Um, Patricia writes, she says, uh, in episode 774, Dave, you talked about how much you liked Quicken 2019. I too have been a decades long Quicken user, but have been dragging my feet about upgrading. I'm currently still using the 2007 version on Mojave on my 2013 iMac. I tried upgrading to 2014 or 2015 a few years ago. And for the first time ever, it was a disaster. And failed to copy over many of my files, so I reverted to my previous version. My question, could you explain any upgrade problems I might experience and how to avoid them? I understand this newest version is subscription only, so how do you feel about having all your personal finances stored in the cloud, and where exactly is Quicken's cloud storage located? I just hate to attempt an upgrade of all my accounts and get caught. So, first of all, you're totally right. Quicken, there was a dark period of, uh, <laughs> for Quicken users and for Quicken themselves, I think where, uh, the, the software just, it sucked. It was not good. That changed in 2017. Uh, they, they realized this, they understood it. They sort of retooled and re-entrenched and re-engaged because they knew there were many of us. And I was one of them who was who were continuing to cobble along with Quicken 2007 
And they knew that this was not a, you know, a supportable scenario and also not the one that they wanted. So yeah, with 2017, uh, Quicken got a lot better and, and, and the upgrade process got better. The, the, the software, I mean, it's, a, it's just different software than it was in the middle there. And, and it truly is like they had cut, they had cut features out of Quicken in that 2014, 15 era. I think, I don't remember exactly the, 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 the years, but it, it was bad. Like it was just, it was not the same thing. And then they had that whole Quicken essentials detour, which was terrible. Uh, those days are past. So feel free with Quicken 2019, I, I think you'll be fine. Obviously, keep a copy of your data, you know, back things up. I, I assume that, you know, because it's a computer, anything could happen, right, with an upgrade. But, I, it, like, I'm I'm a happy camper, and, and I was not trying to use those, you know, interim versions there. In terms of the cloud, you don't have to store all your data in the cloud. Your data is stored locally. You can choose to push your data to the cloud and have it do some management there, but you don't have to do that. Um, so if you're not comfortable with that, you can still you know, just run Quicken and not have it sync all your data up to the cloud. That, that's totally fine. I don't know which cloud they use, but... Um, but I do know that the data is, you know, encrypted at rest up there. It is decryptable by them because you can see it on the web. So it has to be. But um, but if you're not comfortable with that, uh, then yeah, you can you can choose. I think you can actually. I think it's pretty granular if I rem if memory serves. So, yeah, I would I would definitely check it out. And my guess is that um, Quicken 2007 is not going to run under Catalina. Like RC default app might. I'm pretty sure Quicken 2007 <laughs> ain't. So yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Any uh, any thoughts on that, Mr. Braun? No, never. Uh, never did Quicken. Oh, interesting. What do you use to manage your finances, if if you don't mind me asking publicly? Mint, with, with, which is oh, kind that, of Quicken acquired quick, them. Well, it's in, in, into it. Yeah, so yeah. it's online. Uh, I don't know that I didn't. Hmm. Is Mint an Intuit product or is it a Quicken product? Because Quicken is no longer. Quicken divested from Intuit years and years ago. They were, they were. Uh, I think that there was a private equity firm that kind of took them away from from Intuit. So I don't. I, um, I thought Mint was part of Quicken, not part of Intuit. But I could. Be, oh no, it's it's oh, part no, of Intuit. It's, because it's Intuit. I'm on okay. the Mint page, and it says Intuit Mint. Yeah, you're so, totally right. You're totally right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So Mint is, as far as I can tell, totally online, and you punch in. You know, so you set up an account, you uh, give it your, you set up an account with them, and then you tell it about your other accounts, like right. your bank accounts. And I think it basically logs in, uh, uh, it logs in as you once you give it your password and stuff like that. And then it sucks the transactions down. And uh, gee, wouldn't that be great if it worked with uh, a certain card that we're going to talk about soon, Dave, but it works with all my other cards and all well, my other That's not the fault of Mint. That's accounts. the fault of Apple Card not working with any oh, I know. online engine. Yeah. Oh, it I know. And uh, and depending on which little bird you listen to, uh, somebody is working on that because oh. that's something a lot of people really want. Oh yeah, I don't think do. I don't think that's a secret. I I think that's just a like I, I think it was we're going to launch this way and you manage it with your phone. But I I, th I mean it's Goldman Sachs. Like other Goldman Sachs cards are accessible by Mint and Quicken and everything else. Mm -hmm. So yeah, my guess is yeah. that 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 so door will be it. open. Yeah, I think so. I think so. But I love Mint because, yeah, I mean, you know, they have a web interface, an iOS app. It'll yeah. give you uh, proactive alerts. You know, the other day it was like, yeah, your credit score just got dinged because you just got an Apple card. And I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, they did a hard pull. And the thing is, they detect that, you know, sure. they, 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 and, you know, they looked at my score and said, hey, your score went down, I think, by like 14 or oh. 10 or something like that. And it's like, you know. I mean, it's not the end of the world. I'm, you know, like you, I'm still a credit rock star, but yeah, <laughs> it was yeah. upsetting. Yeah. It'll come back. <laughs> yeah. It'll come back. Yeah. Yeah. No, it'll be fine. It doesn't, it doesn't take long. I, I, I've had, you know, we bought a couple of cars over the years or whatever. And I mean, it, anytime you, you do one of those, it, it like drops, but only for a few mm. months and then it just comes right. Because back you did a car loan. Correct. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, and when they did a yeah, and when, they did a query. When they're going to do a zero percent loan, man, if they if they want to finance Ooh. my purchase, I'm happy to do it. Well, you need to be careful though with with car loans because you, you need to make sure that they're not just baking. I mean, there's all somebody's always going to be making money, right? Like, and that's fine. That, that's okay, but you just need to make sure that you're not 
you know, taking that 0% loan and then paying an extra, you know, two grand on the back end somewhere else. So just, you know, just look out for yourself there. Yeah. Wow. 0% though. That's a, that's a good rate. Yeah. I wish we could all get that. Right. <laughs> right. Well, again, it's usually an incentive for a new car. So, I mean, there's a lot of profit opportunities for new cars. So that, you know, that can just be one of those things where they can add that in as to the deal as sort of a friction free point. And, you know, but there's money made else, elsewhere, which is mm. fine. I mean, people should make money. It's, it's fine. It's, I remember that when, when I got my aging still current vehicle, um, that was one thing I was able to negotiate. So Saturn, in addition to a lot of uh, uh, some car sales places, um, do not negotiate on price. A lot Saturn of, doesn't exist anymore, so they did not negotiate on price. Right, they didn't. They right. were like, this is the price for this car. Right. Um, but they did negotiate on the financing. That's because when, when I sat down with them and they're like, oh, well, you know, let's go through GMAC because it's General Motors. And they're like, uh, yeah, here's the interest rate we'll, uh, we'll give you to finance this car. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I just check with my bank and uh, they'll do a car loan for less. And they're like, yeah, hold on. Right. And then, you know, they came back a minute later and like, okay, we'll match that rate. And it's no, like, that that's that. You, yes. <laughs> every, everything is negotiable at, 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 at those points, including like the extended warranty, if you want that and all that stuff. I mean, I, I know we're getting off the, the rails here a little bit, but um, <laughs> no, but it truly is like, you, you know, it never hurts to ask. And, and the, the nicer you ask, the, the greater the chance that the person there is going to want to help you. I always try. I, mean, and- I just gave him the fact. It's like, look, I can finance through my bank for less than you're offering. So right. if you'd like the money, I'll, I'll give it to you. But you know, you got to you got to bend a little bit. Or and yeah, I did. just I make him my friend. I you know I have this this philosophy, and I I do this with when I am the, when I am giving customer service to someone and also when I am receiving customer service and it's, I want to be on the same side of the desk as you, not maybe not like physically, that might be a little uncomfortable in some of those small little finance offices and car dealerships, but, but, but figuratively it's let's work on this together. Let's not, we're not, we're not adversaries here. We are associates here. Right. And, and one of us is helping the other or in a, in a perfect world, we're both helping each other. And, and when you do that, especially in that scenario, they're so used to people being adversarial that when you come in and you're like the nice guy and all that, you got to be careful because they're really good at, at what they're doing. And, and if you get too comfortable with them, you wind up spending more. But um, but if, if you can just be like friendly and, and nice and be their partner in this, I've found that you can get people to, the, especially in the finance people generally have a lot of leeway um, in car dealerships. So. Oh, yeah. And, so, and I was their friend uh, as it. long as they gave me a competitive rate, which they did. So, well, you know, you'll get them to tell <laughs> but that's they the weren't th- going to be my friend. <laughs> right. Right. No. And that's the thing is just get them to, you know, just buddy right up with them. Um, and you can, you can get a lot. I, and I, and do it with the manager too. It's, it's always, you know, nice guy. It's always a good thing. So anyway, um, <clears throat> speaking of the Apple card, Edward has a good piece of advice. Might even call this a quick tip. He says, uh, I want to make sure we remind any users that are in the Apple upgrade program and have the Apple card to change your payment method because your Apple card will get you a 3% daily cash reward for your monthly payments in the Apple upgrade program for your iPhone. He says, I just made my first payment to Citizens One using the Apple card and received the 3% reward. So this isn't just for the Apple upgrade program. If you finance through Apple in any way, it seems like this would work because I finance through Apple, uh, the phone again, 0% interest. Why not? Uh, I'm not part of the upgrade program, but um, because I, because I know I'll keep the phone, but through citizens one, change it to Apple and you'll get 3% cash back on that. So that's not a bad little deal. Yeah, I've actually run across uh, uh, somewhat of a tangent to this, but I'm going to offer it because I I, I think it's useful. Um, I was having a back and forth with, uh, uh, and you'll see the email trail in in our box, Dave. It didn't make it into today's discussion. But um, so one was a question about closing dates and stuff like that. And we'll leave that for another time because I haven't yet had that happen. But the thing is, the three, you got to read. Always read the details. Always read all the documentation you get here. 
Because the other day I was going to buy an Apple gift card. And so I have a local uh, uh, warehouse store, BJ's, and they offer, um, as do many, like Costco, I think also does, they offer discounts. Like in my case, they offer a 5% discount on a Apple uh, Apple gift card. Sure. So so I get a $100, for example, I get a $100 Apple gift card for 94 whatever. Sure. And I was like, oh, well, you know, let me put it on the Apple card because I'll get 3% back. No. Be careful because if you read their terms, and yes, you know this, but I just want to mention this to people. The thing is, the three percent currently only applies to if you buy something in an Apple Store, Apple.com, the App Store, or iTunes. Right. It does not apply if you buy an Apple product, like an Apple gift card, from someone else. But if you can now, use have, Apple Pay to pay for that at Best Buy, you get your two percent. Otherwise, you just get 1% if you use right. the Right, and card. the thing is I actually use, so I have another card where I get 2% back on um, warehouse stores, so I use that instead, but yes, you're right. Um, but the thing is they recently announced, so now they rolled the card out, and I think you have yours now. I don't know if you have the physical card yet, Dave. Not yet. But, um, so they also, and I think they're going to expand this uh, as do many other cards. So I saw this, and I thought that was kind of interesting. So if you do Uber or Uber Eats, you will also get 3%. That's right. Yep. Yeah, no, you're right. Pay attention to the details. It's good. Um, I did want to offer, before we move on from the Apple Card, in, in last week's episode, we mentioned that the Apple Card offers a way of auto-paying your minimum balance. That's not true. They have ways of auto-paying your entire balance or auto-paying a fixed amount. But currently, there is no way to tell the Apple Card to auto-pay your minimum balance, which is kind of a drag. Um because I what I I do that with all my other credit cards and I highly recommend it. It avoids it helps you to avoid late fees. If you know, I, I have one day a month where I process all of my my bills and pay everything. And if I'm traveling or something, I might miss a, a payment. Like if that gets shifted by a few days if I'm away, I might miss the you know, the payment date for my cards. So I just go online and it, to every one of my cards and say auto pay the minimum balance, you know, five days before the due date every month, no matter what. And then I can pay the bill and it's fine, but I know that I have that safety net there that I'm never going to have a late payment. As you know, I'm obsessed with my credit rating. So, uh, you know, this is just one way to protect that. And Apple doesn't let me do that in a, in a, in, in that way. I hope they change it. So I just wanted to share that with everybody. We do though have a lot of, we have several questions about Synology disk stations, and we have enough time to finally fit these in to an episode so i want to do it mr braun if that's okay by you um it is i'm gonna bring up a link here though because i, I don't think you're going dave but um, actually synology has regular events throughout the country here and they're going to be having one in a couple of months um in new york city so cool. um yeah, I might make it for that. I don't know, but but yeah, we'll put a we'll put a link to that in the show notes. For but it's sure. awesome. I mean, you get to interface with everybody up into including the big cheese. They talk about all their plans for the future. They give away things, and I've actually won a couple of things. So, um, uh, if you can make it into uh, Manhattan, um, is it September? I think it is. It is. Um, I think it's. I, anyways, I'll, I'll yeah. get the link to it, and okay. I'll, I'll paste it in the notes here. But um, cool. But yeah, more synology. We love them. Well, yeah, indeed. So um, I'll start with Mike. Mike asked sort of a, a generic question that'll sort of dive us into this. He says, I've got a, a disk station 1513 plus with five WD red drives, two or four gigs and three are three gigs. He says, I'm going to replace two of the three gig drives with a couple of the new six gig drives. So as to increase my storage, do you recommend that I stick with the WD red drives or go with the new Seagate iron wolves? I've heard you mention both. And honestly, I, you know, for those of us that are using these at home or in our small offices, I, I honestly don't think there's that much of a difference um, in terms of these drives in order to say that one would be better than the other. The Iron Wolf drives, yes, have the deep in, deeper integration, uh, sort of goes beyond smart, which we were talking about earlier, where the Iron Wolf drives can report far more meaningful information about their status than smart would allow and the disk station can read that. So there is that integration there. And if all else would be equal, I would say, sure, go with that because why not? Right. You've got like, it's it, at the very least it's fun. You can sort of look and, and do those iron wolf reports. Um, but right now looking at six terabyte drives, I am seeing that uh, the six terabyte iron wolf is 
one seventy at Amazon, and the six terabyte WD Red Pro is one ninety five. So uh, I I would go with the uh, with the one that's one seventy in it. So happens that that's the iron wolf so you get the extra features as a bonus so uh, yeah I, I, either one i would not use a non nas drive in i would not recommend that you purchase a non nas drive for your nas john i know you use them that's fine i still have a couple of green drives yeah. in my uh in in both of my nas and uh they haven't failed yet but it's not what they were meant for. No, and they're not really designed for NAS. So, they're not. Uh, as yeah. they die, I I get either a. And yeah, right now I have several Iron Wolf, and like you, I love the integration. Uh, you know the Synology integration where they they can do the extra, um, error and and other processing. Yeah, it's so. fun. It's fun. But but yeah, those green drives are just. Al Alex in the chat room is asking why. Um, they're they're not built for full-time usage right in a nas it's uh it's not uncommon for a drive to just be spinning and running and used you know 24 7 and those green drives are not meant for that also when those green drives note every hard drive um keeps an eye on itself and will take a look uh and find if it finds a bad sector there are usually extra sectors that are unused on the drive that are built there or that are kept there for when the drive finds a bad sector it can remap that to one of these spare sectors that remapping process on the green drives takes a very long time so long in fact that it can start to cause problems with your nas um sp drobo devices are notoriously uh intolerant intolerant of that <laughs> And they will they will blacklist a drive like you. It will say, "Oh nope, this drive it went offline for too long. I'm not letting it back on. You know, there's something wrong with it." Um, even though the drive has remapped, right? And it's just that those green drives are not meant to be mission critical. They're not meant to be run full time, and so uh, you know it, it's just how it works. So I would I would definitely put the um, the no. The you're NAS right. I drives. remember the last time I had a green drive fail in one of my Synology. So one Synology, you can set it up to alert you when there's a bad sector or or you can set a threshold i set it to one okay yeah fair <laughs> i think makes sense and the thing is i had one of the green drives fail at first it was like oh there's one bad sector and i'm like nah, all right that, that, that that's cool a couple of days later it was like yeah now there's 500 bad sectors <laughs> yeah so right that's the thing it to like keep cascaded an eye on. in that it, it just started going downhill like my dad's got a drive or I have a drive in the disc station that lives at my dad's house. Um, and he backs up to it and, you know, uses it for light duty stuff. And it has had 134 bad sectors on it for a very mm. long time, but the number's not changing. And, you know, I saw it when it first happened, it went from like zero to 134. I was like, okay. Cause I get the monthly disc report from my disc stations, wherever they happen to be. And I saw that and I was like, okay, maybe I need to replace it. And I didn't get around to it. And I got the next monthly report and it was like 134. This has been going on for two years now. So, uh, you know, keeping an eye on, on, Interesting. Uh, yeah, on the progression of that, really, it's you know, I mean, I think about it like you know, drive cancer. It will not get better. It will probably get worse. The only question is, you know, how quickly. And there, and there is no, you know, there is no way to treat that particular cancer. That we're better at it in humans than we are in drives, um, in many cases, but sadly not all. So, right. Um, right. So. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Like in my case, it was like, okay, this is going downhill fast. If it yeah. stayed at one, then I'd be like, yeah, okay. You're, you're yeah. probably good. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. If it just hung at one, that's fine. In fact, your drive is, like I said, your drive is built with, with spare sectors. So it like a, a, a an amount of these is okay. It's just, you know, when it starts growing and you can see the rate of growth, either, you know, not stop or, or increase. That's when it's like, yeah, maybe it's, you, you know, it's not a question of, if my the drive in any of my <laughs> devices will die it's right. when right so yeah and i will say this I, I have experienced this from time to time where i'll buy you know three or four drives all at once they're all built as part of the same batch they all tend to fail around the same time often um, unless you know something odd happens but when if you've got many drives that you purchased at the same time and you start seeing one fail start swapping them out because the last thing you want is multiple drives to go offline because then you will lose data. So just bear that in mind. 
Right, because that's where even Raid will not save you. No, no. If they all roll over at once. If they all roll over. So that's why backup is important. And Scott actually takes us to the uh, to the next phase of this, the next question in our Synology thing. He says, uh, I'm considering getting the model you have, John, the DS918+. Plus. One reason I'm hesitating is cloud backup. Uh, I see Synology offers something to back up to a cloud service. However, I don't see a way to use what I already have, Backblaze. Is there an easy way to keep the data on the DS918 Plus synced to a drive on my Mac? I pay for Backblaze on my Mac, so this would allow my Backblaze backup to keep a copy of items in the cloud as my off-site backup. I asked Synology this question, but they didn't really have a straight answer. It says, specifically, I'm concerned with photos because I need to move some online version of photo storage so my wife can see all our photos. Currently, I'm using Aperture, which I know I need to stop using. I have not found the perfect solution, but I need to move to something, and I'm thinking that PhotoStation may be good. Uh, I think it'll allow me to automatically upload images from both my and my wife's phones so I can manually add photos from our real cameras. The concern, of course, is backups. Uh, we'll talk about PhotoStation versus Moments in a minute here, but... Um, Yes. So to answer your question, yes, you can sync the data on your, the files on your disk station with your Mac. Uh, the, the software that's, that's, that does that is Synology drive. Now Synology drive is sort of a big umbrella term now that has lots of things underneath it. But one of the main ones is drive sync where essentially it runs just like Dropbox. If you're familiar with that, where you have a folder or a series of folders on your Mac and you can tell Drive to sync the, those folders with their, you know, their mates that sit over on your disk station. And it works great. I've been using, it was called Cloud Station for a while, and then they changed the name to Drive a few years ago. And I've been using it for probably almost 10 years now, maybe, I mean, certainly more than five as, as my main storage for my files. So yes, you could do that sync and then have that backed up with Backblaze. Also though, you can use what, Synology calls cloud sync, which is the same kind of thing, except instead of syncing to your Mac, it syncs to a cloud service and Backblaze is an acceptable destination uh, for a Synology cloud sync backup. And so that might also be your uh, be the answer for you here. So we'll put a link to, to both of those in the show notes here. And um, uh, yeah, Synology, uh, there, there's a lot of different ways to back things up. And then, like you said, you could use Hyper Backup to back up to many different clouds, but but Backblaze isn't currently one of them. Uh, I back up to Synology C2 Cloud, which is their oh, data store. okay. Yeah. I thought it was. Okay, uh, so it Hyper Backup, been. which is their yeah. deprecated, I guess you could say. Say that again? <clears throat> what? Well, you shouldn't be using Hyper Backup if you can use Drive, right? Oh um, no, they 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 both serve different purposes. I think Drive is for syncing amongst your like from your disk station as the server, if you will, to all your okay. computers, and then Hyper Backup is for the the disk station to actually back itself up, and and that Hyper Backup has specific destinations that are options. Um, Cloud Sync uses so Hyper Backup will sync will back up your data as a blob, if you will. Cloud mm -hmm. Sync will actually sync your files to a cloud and you can point it at Dropbox oh, okay. or Backblaze or you know, lots of others. So there's just a lot of different options. And and that's both the benefit and the frustrating part or confuse I don't want to say frustrating, confusing part of, of having a disk station is there's a lot of different ways to do similar things, but they all kind of serve mm -hmm. their own purposes. So yeah. Okay. No, you're right. I, I I'm looking at the list here and it says cloud services and uh yeah, Backblaze is not there. Right. So Yeah, it's not there. Yeah, I think you're right, though. I think it used to be there. I think there used to be a way to back up mm. with Hyper Backup to Backblaze, but, but not anymore. So, all right. Jeff has kind of a, he has a big question, but we'll, we'll see if we can go through it. He, um, he wants, he's curious about setting up a new Synology disk station, and he has a lot of uh, individual questions about it. So we'll see how quickly we can go through these and maybe we'll revisit uh, the end of his list in a future episode, or maybe we'll get through it. He says, number one, I want to replace Dropbox with my own cloud file storage for both my wife 
and I. And we just talked about that. Synology Drive is exactly that. And it's private. It's only stored on, you know, on your Synology or an, and the other devices that you choose to sync it to. But it's never stored on Synology servers unless you back it up and you can encrypt it or, you know, or Dropbox's servers or anything like that. So that's that to me, that's the sort of the killer app of the Synology because it's so easy to use and it's something that we all Many of us, not all of us, but many of us uh, have been doing with other cloud services like iCloud or Dropbox or Box.net or any of those over the years. So that's that. Um, he says, number two, I want to move my Plex server from an old Mac mini uh, that's not running great to my NAS. And, uh, and that's pretty straightforward. Migrating your Plex data is very doable if you follow very specific steps. And I went through this recently because I migrated from one disk station to another. And uh, one of the, I asked in the Plex forums and, and one of the Plex employees actually answered with a perfect path to do this. And it was not at all what I expected. And it was very easy. And thankfully I followed that path because otherwise it would have been, in fact, I didn't follow that path initially. And I just had to wipe my data and not wipe my original data, but wipe my, you know, the, the, the migrated data and start and do the migration again. It's been, it's like way better. It's like, Oh, this, this is going to take me an extra 30 minutes. I wonder if I can fix it. It was like, no, no, just do the 30 minutes. It's totally fine. Things are much better now. So I will put, um, uh, I will put this link in there. It's about migrating, you know, the, the, um, the answer was about migrating from one disk station to another, but it, it's the same Plex data is Plex data. It doesn't matter you know where it's living so okay as far as the implementation though if i'm not mistaken so if you're going to be doing plex and especially if you're going to be transcoding video right you want you do want to get a synology like that so the 918 plus has enough uh oomph. yes to well, be able to do video transcoding properly. let's be more specific about oomph because it, you, you okay you well it's not just CPU speed. It's that the processor mm -hmm. in your 918 plus has the, has a hardware transcoding engine in it. Mm -hmm. And, and that's where the oomph actually matters, right? It like, you can do it with in so in what they call software transcoding, which is just using the main CPU, but it's way better. Like I, I move to the same, I have exactly the same CPU that you do, John. I have the five bay version, which is the 1019 plus, but, um, that it that CPU with that that hardware transcoding engine makes Plex like the, my disk station doesn't like heat up or, or you know get bogged down anymore when I'm watching a video that needs to be transcoded. It just plays it because it's, it's because it's got it okay. built in there. Yeah, I guess the warning is there Don't are buy the some cheap one. Synology units that may not be up to the task of doing video at peak efficiency right? it totally to, yeah to be polite no you're totally right it in fact they they do a good job if you go online to synology's um nas selector you can see which ones you know like like how, what kind of video it can do in in real-time transcoding and all of that stuff but yeah it, you know a lot of the sort of smaller uh lower price two bay units do not have to use your term enough oomph to really get the job done it it's a combination of cpu and of course ram um but yeah no it's a that's a really good point john yep i i agree i agree all right what else do we have here let's see um i think his next thing was about time machine he wants to use time machine for his wife uh wife's computer and his computer yeah uh, absolutely in fact we were talking about this in i think the, uh, two episodes ago where you um, you were saying that you back up your time machine destination on your Synology so that you can restore if it gets corrupted. And then um, I suggested using um, uh, the, the snapshots for that. And then at, like days after I did the snapshots, John, my, mm -hmm. my laptop's backup corrupted. And it was like, oh, sweet. And I just, I, like with one flick of the mouse, the, my, my data was restored. It took no time at all. It was brilliant. So, wow. Yeah, it's awesome, man. The one thing I will say is put all of your put your time machine data on a separate shared volume 
for each computer if you're going to use the snapshot thing because you the easiest way to restore a snapshot is to do the whole thing the whole shared volume and if you if if you have all of your time machine backups in one shared volume well then you have to roll them all back as opposed to just being able to roll one back easily you can roll one back but it requires like mounting the huh. snapshot and copying it which takes forever so if you want to do it fast have everything in its own little 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 oh, okay yeah yeah my only observation is that setting the whole thing up is still kind of weird i agree in that and that you got to, uh, or, or at least the way that I set it up and the way that I think most, uh, they instruct you to is that you set up a separate user or a separate user account, and then you allocate a certain amount of space on the drive to yeah, you, represent the time machine volume. And you use quotas, which is, a, yes, which is non-intuitive, yeah, but it makes, it makes sense once you do it. Um, <clears throat> And I've I found an article at nine to five Mac where they they walk through this in a very very clear way. So I'll put a link to that in the um, in our show notes here because yeah that's, yeah yeah good and call. I mean I'm still yeah one of my machines here. I'm actually almost at my quota, and the thing is, Time Machine is doing what it should in that it expires the oldest stuff. Right um, now, I could expand the quota, but it's like. Do I want to do that or do I want to start from? So think about your, yeah. So number one, think about your quota. I think most people would agree that you probably want your time machine volume to be double the space that you're using on your hard drive. I don't know if you're with me on that. That that's my that's been my guideline for yeah. both of my machines here is that I typically allocate about twice the space of the hard drive to the time machine partition. That's a, it, it is a good rule of thumb to start with. If I have a drive and I like, let's say I have a one terabyte drive and I know that I'm only using, you know, 300 gigs on it. I don't necessarily allocate two terabytes. I might allocate, you know, one and a quarter terabytes or something to the time machine just because I don't need to, you know, I don't need my 300 gig backup to be there four times. You know what I'm saying? Like it, I think more about the, amount of data that I'm backing up, not the size of the drive that it's on. I mean, you got to think about both because you might wind up filling that drive at some point down the road. Right. But if, if you know your usage double, you know, in that case to put two terabytes out there for 300 gigs of data, that's, you know, it's kind of a lot, but, but yeah. Yeah. Yep. And of course the other thing is please, please use time machine editor. So your machine is not continually hacking up especially if you're on a network connection because yeah. I, I i just found that infuriating i'll put a link to that in the show notes uh you know i'm going to save i know we said we'd talk more about um photo station and moments I, well I, i'll do a, a, a quick little bit on it and then maybe there'll be some more questions and we'll talk about it more photo station is the old uh engine that will allow you to manage photos on your disk station moments is relatively new. It's, it's only a couple of years old. I would use moments. Uh, it's way more automated than photo photo station was kind of dumb in that it doesn't do any auto like parsing of your photos or anything like that. I mean, it'll do some rudimentary stuff, but moments will look at your photos. It'll identify faces. It will identify, you know, you could say, find me all my photos that I, that I've taken of cars, or I can say, find me all the photos of John F. Braun and it'll find Mr. John F. Braun and, you know, and it'll auto categorize them and, and create, you know, albums by month and year and, and location and all of that stuff. So moment, and it all happens on, on device on the disk station. So it's not, you know, sending your data to the cloud or anything. So I, I highly recommend using moments instead of photo station for your photos, which was Jeff's final question here. So I think though, that's got to, uh, that's got to bring us to the, uh, the outro here, my friend, it's time. It's time. And I think really? the band is around. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, it's, it's, this show has gone on longer than, than most have recently. So, but that's okay. Yeah. It's fun. We're having Mom fun. It was jam packed with all sorts of 
wonderful ingredients for your soup. You, you, you were going on soup. I, earlier, yes, right? that's right. Yeah, it, we talked, and we did. We talked about like the, 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 the my prediction of acronym soup turned out to be right. We talked for about stew. A, How about stew? I, I I think I'll have stew tonight. Are you, are you having stew? All right, well, that's a little heartier. <laughs> sure, that's right. I think that's the, what's is that the difference between soup and stew? It's one's heartier than the other. Uh, I think uh, stew has more meat to it. Or I think uh, it I've had, cook it longer. Yeah, no. maybe. Yeah, it's a slow cook thing. There's a fast. I don't know. I don't know. I, we should find that out. I, you know what? I bet. I bet you could search Google for that. Um, <laughs> you could also. Uh, we mentioned it many times, so I'll mention it again. You could also just instead of searching Google, you just go to macgeekab.com slash forums and talk about really whatever you want. That's that's your home. I mean, it's our home, right? For all of us. But it really. It is for all of us. It is not just for me and John. It is for all of you to interact, not just with us, but with each other and and help each other. And that is exactly what happens there. It's freaking awesome. So you got to check it out, macgeekab.com slash forums. And uh, yeah, thanks to, uh, to all of you for listening. Thanks to you, Mr. John F. Braun, for, uh, for, you know, for... It's like you know everything you contributed to. I think this is good. It's like you know. I mean, I know we do this together. It's weird to thank you, but it's like, like I'm also very thankful that we get to do this oh, together. No, yeah. thank you. See, you're welcome. Yeah, it's it's like we get to do this together. It's pretty good. Pretty lucky. I want to thank our sponsors. As I mentioned, of course, linodecom mgg MacSales.com ifixit.com slash mgg eero.com slash mgg barebones.com yes Mr. Braun hmm? are you going to say something oh I thought you were saying something oh no no okay smilesoftware.com slash podcast but I may be saying something Dave would you like to say something do you have something to say I would like to, to say, say something and I don't know if you could guess what I'm going to say Dave but I could I think I can but I'm not going to share my guess I'm going to let well, you. If your guess was that I was going to say, don't get caught, you'd be correct. I got it right. Made up. <laughs>